Um, welcome to you all uh, uh, to our special series of COVID-19 sessions. Um, Today is session number 21, a series that we have dedicated to diagnostic, diagnostics in the COVID-19 uh, era. Today we have a special session uh, that we would like to uh, really look into one of the key elements uh, in this fight uh, to the pandemic, uh, against the pandemic. Uh, how ready are our networks to really fight the pandemic? Uh, without a great networks, uh, that would not really work out quite well. Um, our session will be slightly longer than usual today. Uh, it's going to be one and a half hours, uh, exactly 90 minutes. And we have lined up an exciting range uh, of presentations, uh, including three country experiences uh, today. Um, we will start with a couple of presentations uh, followed by a and a And uh, remember, uh, as usual, please enter any of your comments, questions uh, 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 or into the chat box uh, as we go through uh, the presentations and we shall take them at the uh, end uh, of the set of presentations. I'm going to be co-moderating uh, this session uh, with uh, Dr. George Alemji, uh, who is the Sec Senior Technical Advisor uh, at the Office uh, uh, Global AIDS Coordinator uh, and Health Diplomacy, popularly known as OGAC. Uh, let me hand over to my colleague, George, uh, to give a few remarks as we start. George, over to you. Yes, um, good morning and uh, thank you to ANAFI and to the African Society for Laboratory Medicine for agreeing to repeat this very, very important uh, topic and session that was uh, presented at the just uh, concluded AIDS conference. I think it becomes so necessary to repeat this uh, session for, for several reasons. We know that a lot of uh, the members of the current um, ASLM lab committee of practice uh, did not participate at this uh, AIDS conference. And uh, considering the very, very importance of uh, the DNO, I think this is a unique opportunity for us again to rebroadcast and share that knowledge. Uh, also, uh, we know that uh, DNO has become uh, a core component of lab activities, and uh, the more we present and share this information with uh, policymakers and also decision makers in the different countries, the better for us. So the message goes as wide as possible. And we know that all those people are part of uh, the current uh, committee of practice, and they definitely will participate now. So what we know so far is that uh, laboratory network optimization has allowed for the design of improved uh, lab uh, networks. Uh, it completely uh, defines the most uh, optimal uh, instrument mix, uh, whether uh, what type of instruments and also um, where they are supposed to be placed. And of course, uh, it provides an opportunity for us to get a good um, design of efficiency and systems to connect uh, testing demands. And now we have not just conventional instruments like what we wish to have in doses, point of care instruments have come into play, there's also the near point of care instruments. And now we're talking about multiplexing. So this is a very, very important um, opportunity for countries to go and to also to uh, implement the diagnostic network optimization to ensure that the instruments are appropriately placed. And also, um, of course, uh, with the coming of the COVID-19, all what we've seen is that the laboratory has become very, very critical for diagnostics and expansion. So um, an important uh, question for us today is um, how have uh, countries been able to leverage uh, their existing diagnostic network that has been done over the years uh, to actually support uh, COVID-19 uh, testing? Uh, as Sanafi just said, to, for us to really uh, have a response to this question, we do have three very, very important um, countries that have implemented uh, diagnostic network optimization, and they were able to leverage uh, this uh, infrastructure to support COVID-19 testing. We're talking about in terms of um, how the mapping was done, uh, also um, how have they made use of uh, the infrastructure, including things like the data systems, the sample referral systems that are in this country, and most importantly, uh, waste management, which you know has been critical and of course very important for COVID. So um, this is an opportunity for countries to listen to what has happened to other countries and also see how they can help accelerate um, 
the diagnostic network optimization in their various countries. So just uh, before those three country presentations, we will hear first from Smyka uh, Delusi from, uh, from UNITE. We will start the presentations with uh, leveraging investments in diagnostic network optimization to expedite planning and implementation of SARS-CoV laboratory testing. So uh, Smyka, if you are there, I think uh, the microphone is now um, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, George. And thanks, Anafi, also um, to you and to ASLM for deciding to host this, this session, especially knowing how much it was um, timely and also necessary when, when we were organizing for the AIDS 2020 conference and recognizing actually that it is the lab community that we wanted to speak to as well. Um, in the context of, of, of COVID, but also outside of it as well. Um, my name is, as, as George said, uh, Smilka Dudusini, and uh, I work uh, at UNITAID um, as a program manager for our molecular diagnostic investments. Um, and these span across HIV, tuberculosis, uh, human papilloma virus, and most recently since March 2020, uh, we also started investing in COVID-19 testing and mostly in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the presentation that I will give will be short and, and concise and, and will really aim to um, set the stage for Cameroon, Nigeria and Zimbabwe colleagues, uh, especially looking into um, HIV and TB investments to date, but also how they linked to the preparedness that we thought we had and we had, and, and as you will see in some of these presentations, uh, uh, when, when COVID-19 came and, and, and when our laboratory and diagnostic networks had to be um, to respond very quickly to the needs uh, for testing. Um, so just to start and to say, um, when we look into um, molecular testing capacity, and as George said, the de both deployment and utilization are, are very important. Um, we can see that um, as early as um, in, in, in early 2010, um, um, this slide shows 2012, um, as the World and, and uh, World Health Organization as well started looking into molecular testing as an uh, essential tool for monitoring um, HIV treatment uh, success. Uh, we have seen an incredible, uh, I would say, and, and also consistent growth in molecular diagnostic uh, testing capacity across sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see the, the, the amazing numbers where in 2012 we had um, uh, some 5 million tests to, to finish in 2019 with 20 million. And this is an incredible growth. Um, a similar picture um, you see when you look at the TB molecular testing, and here it shows uh, only Cephid TB testing volumes as, as the only solution um, that was at that point on the market uh, to do molecular testing for TB. But you can see that with the, with the enter, entrance of, of that test in 2012, uh, we, we ended up 2018 with 12 million tests um, uh, being done worldwide and it is an amazing growth and, and I wanted to show these two slides um, also from the perspective of saying when COVID started we did not have years to achieve these volumes. We, we literally had um, weeks, uh, um, I would not even say months. And when we started thinking about what were the enabling factors of um, us actually managing to do that, uh, provided that the supplies were there and, and I think on the side of manufacturers, unfortunately, that, uh, that was not always the case. But um, we looked into to what extent um, our networks were optimized to respond to any pandemic, uh, especially the pandemics that uh, require an immediate uh, response. Uh, and that are highly dependent on molecular testing. So um, the investment in, in, in diagnostics to date ha have really shown that um, the disease priorities are shifting and, and we need to be aware, uh, aware of that and, and also invest in diagnostics in such a way that not only we think about one disease, but a, 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 a 
existing diseases as well as those that we, we, we cannot foresee coming but will come as, as was the case with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so there is an increasing, increasing need for molecular testing. Um, there is also a technology evolution that um, leads us to the necessity of thinking about how to uh, uh, address different diseases uh, uh, in, in a very comprehensive and network way. There are different devices that are either at point of care or at laboratory and centralized setting. There are multiplexing solutions. So even if we don't think about it, the technologies are pushing us to um, actually um, address different needs of, of people living with different diseases um, at, at one point and at one, one spot. There are also funding considerations. Unfortunately, uh, we do know that um, um, the funding is flattening, and especially in the in the sense of COVID-19, uh, we are seeing that it will not be increasing for different diseases separately. So we need to recognize the past investments and, and really build off of that as an incremental additional cost to be able to address ad other uh, things coming down the pipeline. Um, so it's really moving from, from those parallel system programs uh, to, a, to a systematic approach, a network approach, and um, as a consortium of partners that has been existing since uh, uh, more than three years, um, partners that are either procuring or investing in molecular diagnostics, uh, we have started thinking about um, um, diagnostic network optimization and really articulating what that process uh, means and what are key principles that need to be respected in, in order for that process to actually result in the biggest efficiencies. And of course, what is the priority for us is the, is the highest public health impact. Integrated Diagnostics Consortium is the consortium of partners like um, uh, Unitaid, PEPFAR, ASLM, um, WHO, um, Global Fund, GDF, Stop TV Partnership. So across different diseases, find as well. So we looked at uh, everything that requires molecular testing, HIV, TB, hepatitis, uh, uh, HPV, and, and nowadays COVID. And setting the stage for the presentations that are coming, I wanted to, to really just zoom into also the, the what we call diagnostic network optimization so that the understanding of the principles and, and, and the whole um, objective of these processes that were then implemented in Cameroon, uh, Nigeria and Zimbabwe are well set up front so that you can also connect uh, some of the successes of these with, uh, uh, with the COVID-19 preparedness. And this is the process and an approach that is usually uh, very thorough and very, um, to an extent, lengthy, but for the good, good reasons, um, that aims to redesign the diagnostic network setup in order to, in, first and foremost, increase access. So, so we're talking about public health impact um, and then maximize that impact and generate efficiencies. And we're looking at how we deploy and where the where we deploy instrument mix, what that instrument mix is, and on the other hand, what the national priorities in terms of disease strategies are, and, and, and really identifying the most appropriate locations where these instruments should be placed and, and then designing those network referral linkages. Um, it is really how we see it, that there are two different uh, uh, objectives to it. So, so, so we're looking at the direct impact and indirect impact, but, but really aiming to increasing access to testing and generating greater public health impact, increasing operational efficiencies and decreasing total cost per test, um, especially when we are looking at um, uh, the optimal also usage of, of different instruments that, that, that sometimes have a throughput that, that is not necessarily achieved um, if not placed uh, appropriately. And then of course we are creating greater visibility um, uh, so that the funding can be allocated appropriately and um, the ministries of health are in, in, in higher capacity and, and more enabled to, to make uh, um, and coordinate uh, um, decision making, especially for addressing different diseases. And to an extent, we are also creating a more competitive and dynamic marketplace because there is a full visibility of data utilization and, and which creates the competition um, and uh, uh, between suppliers that are supplying the molecular diagnostics. Finally, the DNO principles are really looking at um, uh, we need the leadership of the MOH um, and we need the alignment with the country health strategies and priorities. Um, it is 
person-centric uh, and we are looking at um, centering um, um, the molecular testing around the needs of a person rather than than person being sent and and and, and uh, navigating the system themselves uh, aiming to be comprehensive um, um, it is long it is uh, it is uh, laborsome uh, but if we are looking at it it really the, the national is better than regional uh, including multiple disease essays so that we are not having those verticality of, of, of uh, approach um, uh, that can maybe uh, hinder some of the efficiencies that we could achieve. Um, as I said, uh, the optimal scenario is uh, um, should also match the funding available and, and there is the accountability to be built in uh, with, with clear targets and, and robust M&E setup. Um, it should not penalize any disease area, and that's sometimes difficult, but uh, having different diseases around the table and uh, disease programs uh, around the table is very important. And as, as uh, you can imagine, also all key stakeholders should act together and be collaborative and transparent. I will finish here and, and just to say that um, it is incredible and, and, and I'm very grateful that we are um, having this opportunity to repeat the presentations from Cameroon, Nigeria and, and Zimbabwe. And to an extent, uh, in, some, in some cases, it comes as an afterthought, the, the pandemic preparedness, but, but I think at least COVID is now teaching us on how to realign some of the processes and some of the thinking to be able to uh, much better be prepared for anything that is coming down the line. So George, over to you, uh, looking forward to other presentations as well, and then also the discussion in the end. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Smyuka, uh, for, for that presentation um, and a good layout of what, what is coming through. So next, uh, we will hear from the first country uh, experience um, that is on leveraging existing systems uh, to really uh, respond to, to, to the pandemic uh, uh, based on the networks that we have optimized. And to do that, we have uh, Mr. Charles Atem uh, from Chai, uh, Cameroon. Charles, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anafi. Uh, thank you for once again giving us uh, the opportunity uh, to share our experience in Cameroon um, on how we leveraged on DNO work that we started uh, sometime around 2017 uh, to be able to support how testing uh, for COVID in country uh, was activated and rapidly uh, expanded. Slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, Anafi. Great. So, so basically, I will just be telling you a small story uh, of how we uh, went from our DNO work uh, to be able to uh, strategize on how we activate testing for COVID. Um, and then how we put in place some system solutions to be able to accompany all of that. So my presentation will be done in three parts. In the first part, I'll just talk about briefly uh, an overview of molecular diagnostic space in Cameroon. Uh, thereafter which um, I would share with you in the second part of my presentation, some highlights of the work we've been able to do on DNO in country and how we leverage on that to put in place other systems arrangements uh, more particularly uh, data management system solutions uh, to be able to improve the service uh, which is being delivered. And then I'll exit my presentation uh, by sharing with you some key takeaway uh, messages um, that we learned so far through the process. Slide. Next slide, Anafi, please. So basically Cameroon, uh, as you would see on the map, is a country of 10 regions. Uh, we have over 5,000 health facilities in the country. Uh, our molecular diagnostic space is, can be described as uh, a mix uh, in the sense that we have both conventional and point of care platforms. Uh, and our conventional platforms, we can group them as on the one hand open platforms, on the other hand closed platforms. Uh, in which case the open platforms, we use mostly the ABI 2500, 
And then for the closed platform, we have uh, Abbott in country, uh, about 11 Abbott sites and seven ABI uh, testing sites in the country. And then on the other hand, we have the POC platforms, which we can group them as a true point of care where we have the MPMA uh, and of course, a near, near point of care. I just want to highlight that uh, this experience we, we would share with you is coming from a, an, an HIV TB uh, experience. So looking at a molecular diagnostic testing from an HIV perspective and how we leveraged on that to be able to um, to integrate COVID testing on our existing uh, platforms. And on the map on, the, on your right, it's actually showing you a little bit of device placement in the country uh, where we have more of the devices concentrated and where we have a few of the devices. One key message to already highlight here is that um, with mapping out your diagnostic networks, you're already able to see uh, where you have sufficient investment, sufficient capacity, and areas where you do not have enough capacity or no capacity at all. And, and that's some sort of a blueprint in, in how you move forward in terms of scaling up testing capacities in country and knowing where there is uh, uh, looking at utilization rates and so on. And, and that can be, it can inform so how uh, you expand testing. Uh, slide and I'm Next slide. Hello, Anafi. Can we? Okay, thank you. So, moving on, moving on, uh, setting up that, uh, uh, just showing you a little bit of how uh, molecular diagnostics. Uh, can you? Yeah, yeah. This slide. Okay, that's fine. So, so. This is where we try to highlight um, our experience in DNO in Cameroon. Uh, basically, DNO for us meant a couple of things. Uh, before, prior to starting up uh, our DNO work in country, testing was highly centralized uh, for HIV, particularly for EID and viral load. Uh, we had more of testing capacities uh, in the center region. So we had samples had to move from all over, virtually all over the country uh, to a central point to be tested. We had challenges around sample transport systems. We had challenges around um, uh, supply chain, managing the supply chain effectively. We also had issues around data management systems. So for us, DNO was coming in at a time when uh, we wanted to answer questions around how do we optimize our sample transport? How do we optimize um, how we manage our supply chain in country, how do we optimize how we manage our data, as well as how do we manage the balance between the new point of care that was coming in into the country at the time and the existing uh, conventional systems. How do we play with that balance uh, with all these systems in the country? And so in 2017, the country actually had their first DNO workshop. And the output from this workshop was basically an Excel sheet uh, where we um, essentially grouped all information we knew in the country across the 10 regions in terms of what were the different testing capacities, what was the utilization rates across different platforms, and where were these platforms actually located? Were they functional or were they not functional? And, and, and this was really a, a very interesting outcome that we had. And, and following up from that meeting, we were opportuned uh, through unit aid funding to be trained on how to use uh, the lab equipped software to now start playing around the data we had started putting together and being able to visualize you know how our existing networks were being laid out and 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 just like everything else and, and what smith highlighted in a presentation dno work uh, goes along with a lot of uh, 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 leadership from from the government and leadership from the moh and here in 2018 we had a very high level advocacy uh, meeting with all key stakeholders where again um, we highlighted the benefits of, of DNO uh, and how it could help the country to improve on the existing networks. On, on the far end where we have a little bit of a before and after uh, images we're showing you there it's just on, on, on the first graph with the purple lines it's just to show you a little bit of how challenging the network used to be where uh, samples moved from virtually very far extreme north of the country to, to, to the center of the country to be tested. 
and it went through a lot of challenges. And you can see that after we started optimizing our network in terms of looking at optimizing the sample transport system, uh, looking at reducing turnaround time, making sure that we decentralize testing capacity as much as possible to where patients were located, you could now see how we not only optimize the sample transport systems, but also came out with a mapping that could show us exactly where additional devices could be placed. And below is a snapshot of one of the regions, the Adamawa region, where one of the things which we leveraged on the DNO work was to be able to do patient mapping to see where uh, the patient concentrations uh, were actually in the country. Where do we have high volumes of patients? Uh, what, what was the level of access in terms of diagnosis for those patients? And how can we change that? What, what number of devices do we need to bring in into such existing networks to improve them? And so below there, we highlight uh, some of the key successes on how we're able to use DNO to really transform our existing um, molecular diagnostic space and see how you know, that information has helped us uh, going forward to activate other testing like COVID. So next slide. And, and in the next slide, we, we begin to show you um, how this, this experience through DNO has actually helped us you know, to, to, to expand rapidly uh, our COVID testing. Next slide, Anafi. Um, and so the, the testing strategy for COVID, in, in Cameroon, the first case for COVID was recorded sometime around March, uh, between March 5th and March 6th. That's when we, we officially recorded our first case of COVID. And during this month of March, uh, we basically had only two labs that had been identified uh, to provide testing capacity for, for COVID. But you could see that over time, over time, uh, what we call a phase one, where we had just two labs testing, going through a phase two, phase three, and right up to phase four, we were able to rapidly increase the number of labs providing molecular testing from two to 15. And just to say that one of the key things we're also able to leverage on in this process was to identify uh, potential gene expert sites that had the available capacity um, to be able to roll out COVID testing uh, in those sites. And then just to highlight there that that's one success on, on what we, we achieve when we do a multiplexing. So we're able to add onto a gene expert site that was already doing TB, HIV, we're, we're also able to add onto those sites uh, COVID testing. And so knowing and having this understanding of, of you know, our testing capacities, our utilization rates, the different platforms where they are in country, whether it's an open platform or a closed platform, really readily uh, trace the path for us to, to, to scale up rapidly uh, to, to, to bring COVID testing to this lab. And, and, and just to highlight here that our scale up for COVID testing actually went from, from, from using open platforms through introducing testing on GeneXpert, and then finally uh, adding on the closed uh, Abbott platforms uh, for use. Next slide, please. Again, with this understanding, we, we are able to map out how health facilities are distributed in, in the country. And this is superimposed with the heat map showing where we currently record uh, COVID cases. And you can see from the heat map on your right that in a way, we can actually uh, 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 we can actually uh, say that this uh, country is, is separated into two halves: a, a lower southern half and an upper northern half. And you see that where we have most of COVID cases recorded in the country is actually in the lower uh, southern half of the country. And if you could look uh, on the map on your left, where we actually are showing you exactly where the different testing labs are for molecular testing, you would see that we've been able to map out most of the testing capacity where we have uh, most of the, the, the COVID cases uh, recorded in country. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that uh, most of this work is done under the leadership of the National Public Health Laboratory and, and also uh, alongside in collaboration with Sancho Pasteur uh, to be able to make all this collaboration and coordination possible. Next slide. Slide, Nafi. Can we go to the next slide, please? 
Thank you. So, so with all these, uh, with all these in mind, uh, I think one of the key things that comes to 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 us is how do we put in place uh, other systems to making sure that some of the successes that we've recorded across DNO and how we've used that to roll out COVID testing rapidly. How do we maintain that? How do we ensure visibility? So, we also highlight here some of the thought processes we put in place uh, to be able to develop uh, data management uh, systems. So basically, uh, we're leveraging on a software which we have put in place to manage HIV data for viral load and EID uh, using uh, the LIMSLIDE software, it's actually called LIMSLIDE. Uh, and onto this LIMSLIDE software, we've been able to build a module uh, for COVID, which would enable us to also capture uh, data uh, real time. But just to say that in the process of rolling out uh, COVID testing, we all know that COVID didn't give most countries uh, enough time to prepare to receive them. So one of the things we did when we activated testing was actually to use already existing uh, data systems to be able to report uh, real time for COVID. And in, in Cameroon's case, we actually started using one of the systems which uh, Sancho Pasteur rolled out called the PLACA. And this PLACA system will be showing you in the next slide a couple of uh, screenshots that we can obtain from a PLACA, the PLACA dashboard. Uh, it actually enables us to, to, to track uh, the, the different labs that are reporting, the timeliness to report their data, and provide several dashboards uh, which we can, we can look at and appreciate, you know, testing trends, look at PCR trends, and look at what, what are the testing volumes and how they evolve over time across both, um, across both conventional and, 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 and rapid testing sites. Next slide, please. So, so you would see that on the next slide, uh, we show you a bit of some of the data systems we put in place. So this is a system that had been used in country uh, by Sancho Pasteur uh, across their network of laboratories to see uh, visualized data real time. So uh, in the process of setting up uh, a more sustainable long-term software solution, uh, which is still in development, we're able to leverage on this placard system to, to in a very short time be able to visualize data. And we can use this to actually see trends, uh, uh, testing trends across the country. And then as you can see from the map on the right, we're beginning to see that testing trends for COVID actually uh, is actually decreasing, but we, 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 we want to, as a strategy, test more to see if truly, you know, we are gradually getting a, a I'm actually out of COVID or if we're not doing enough testing. But again, just to show you how we're able to use existing systems in country to rapidly integrate COVID and, and be able to visualize our data. So far, uh, over about 63,000 PCR tests have been done in the country, but this data system also captures rapid tests, antigen tests that have been done across uh, more or less decentralized and deconcentrated uh, testing sites in the country. And so we, we can see from our dashboard over about 150,000 tests that have been done uh, in, in Cameroon. Slide, please. And, and mo mo moving away from, from uh, slide, Anafi, next slide. Thank you. And, and then the other moving away from, from data management systems to, to be able to, to visualize data uh, more or less on a real time basis. We also uh, put in place together with other partners like the CDC, a call center, uh, which has been um, installed and set up at the National Public Health Lab to be able to follow up remotely with sites to support uh, commodity monitoring. And, and on the front of commodity monitoring, um, under the leadership of CHAI, we've been able to um, rapidly put in place another system um, called the Open LMIS. Uh, on which we've been we've built in a module uh, for COVID. And this has actually enabled us to track uh, commodity stock levels across uh, central warehouses, right down to regional warehouses, and even across testing labs, as well as care and treatment sites. So just to show you again, some of other solutions that we're leveraging on uh, to be able to rapidly put in place systems to enable us you know, track commodity, uh, track data systems, as well as decentralized uh, testing uh, across the, the country. Next slide. So, however, despite all of these uh, uh, 
experience that we're sharing, we've also had some key challenges. And when COVID started, one of the key challenges we encountered was actually the uh, delayed procurement. Unfortunately, uh, the consortium was put in place, which has really uh, facilitated how countries in LMIC settings uh, get commodities uh, to be able to ensure no interruption in, in service delivery for COVID testing. We also noticed that across our labs, uh, there was some kind of repurposing of staff, staff that were initially uh, covering, um, providing service on, on the HIV front. We had to shift and move some of these staff to, to support COVID testing. And, and again, we had some labs we, we, which do not operate on a 24-7 workflow, uh, and we had to shift some of this uh, to start moving towards uh, working uh, on a 24-7 uh, uh, time, time scale. But this is also very challenging, and this has been some of the, the setbacks uh, uh, we're facing for COVID. And then again, we also are still in the process of putting in place a more long-term uh, data management system, but, you know, assuming that the placard system is working, but then uh, the country is still rolling out the, the national limb system that would be able to provide real-time uh, data visibility even uh, beyond COVID. However, next slide, uh, to wrap up, I think we just, the key messages we would like to, to leave you with uh, uh, as follows. The first thing is that we noticed that we did not need any additional investments or equipment to be able to activate testing on COVID. Uh, we basically leveraged on our existing HIV infrastructure to be able to roll out COVID testing. And just to highlight here that uh, we were able to start our testing on the open platforms. One of the advantages we had with the open platform was that at the time, we are able to use uh, the different commodities which are available, which can go on these platforms. So they are not closed, they were, were a bit flexible in terms of how we, 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 we get uh, different reagents and how we can test uh, uh, patient samples for COVID. So that's the first thing that we want to highlight here, that we're able to scale up without any, any need for any additional investments. The second thing is the strategy to rapidly decentralize. So we went from open platform to inexpert and then finally to Abbott, part of which was also influenced by how uh, different commodities were available at different times. Uh, and then again, understanding our existing capacity enabled us to activate different labs progressively at different times. And we started with labs with much larger capacities and then gradually moved on to labs with, with a much uh, smaller capacities and then to also, you know, centralize and deconcentrate testing where appropriate. And then leveraging on existing data systems was also uh, something which we want to highlight. Uh, we did not have to build the placard system from crash. Uh, we just had to integrate and associate a module for COVID. And similarly, for the more sustainable lean slide solution that we present, uh, we just had to just integrate uh, a module for, for COVID. And then one other important thing which uh, Smichka highlighted in the presentation, which I'll also highlight here, is the ability to coordinate with the MOH. And we leverage on, on the, the National Public Health Coordinated, uh, Coordination Platform, uh, where all these labs actually um, uh, 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 are locked on, and then we're able to coordinate real time what happens across the different labs and how we can shift uh, uh, strategies or move or improve or, or change and overcome challenges as they present. And, and, and of course, uh, this really put together is, is the entire package that has enabled us, you know, from the knowledge of understanding our DNO space uh, to right up to where we are in terms of testing for COVID, uh, which we, we would like to share with you. I'd just like to say that DNO involves a lot of work and um, we, we, 10 minutes is usually not enough time to tell you all the stories about DNO, but they're very exciting. And, and I tell you that they've really helped us uh, to pave our way uh, very smoothly around COVID testing uh, in the country. With that, I'll stop here and, and hand over back to, to you, George and, and Anafi. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Charles, for sharing the Cameroon experience. I will quickly introduce uh, Kingston uh, Omo in Maui. Uh, who is uh, a PEP faster with uh, USAID Nigeria. Uh, Kingston will also be sharing with us a Nigeria experience on how existing uh, DNO services were leveraged to support uh, COVID testing in that country. So uh, Kingston, over to you. Uh, thanks, George. Um, so I'll quickly just uh, try and uh, share my slide. 
Um, great. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, like George uh, said, my name is uh, Kingston Omo Emmanuel. Uh, I am the clinical lab manager for USAID Nigeria. Uh, so just like uh, uh, Cameroon has just done, uh, I'll be presenting on our experience in uh, leveraging investment in diagnostic network optimization uh, to speed up uh, SARS-CoV-2 laboratory testing in Nigeria. Uh, so we do not have... Can you can you uh, uh, can you put on a presentation mode? Oh, sorry, yeah. So uh, I would like to start by saying that uh, it's a known fact that um, access to quality laboratory services is uh, a key is key to a successful treatment of a disease condition. And uh, for the access to be uh, there, we need a referral system to provide uh, the samples or the tests to be available to all despite the location where they are and their ability to pay. It was in recognition of this that uh, in 2017, that Nigeria embarked on the rollout of uh, a national integrated specimen referral network, which we call this train in Nigeria, uh, for viral load, EID, CD4 and TB services. The overall goal is for this to serve as the main sample referral network for all clinical and public health samples for laboratory testing and return of results. So the implementation of Nistrin led to an increase in access to laboratory testing for HIV and TB services in Nigeria. It also led to network effectiveness and efficiency so there's a reduction in the costs associated with sample referral. Well, that was the case before the coming of the integrated specimen referral. There was also a reduction in the cost of uh, moving commodities to several laboratories that were operating uh, in the Nigerian system uh, program. And the implementation also led to a reduction in the number of HIV molecular labs from 27 to 17. And so that was what I alluded to earlier because the cost of moving some, I mean, uh, reagents or commodities to these 27 labs has been reduced because some uh, commodities are moved to only 17 laboratories in the country. So the COVID-19 pandemic provided an opportunity to leverage uh, the sample referral network to also move samples for COVID-19 testing. So I just, this is just a snapshot of um, what the sample referral had done, has done in the HIV uh, and TB uh, program. Close to 2 million samples have been moved, moved and results returned since inception in uh, March 2018 uh, till date. I would have moved more, but for parallel movement of samples by, you know, partners and individuals that are also that are involved in the HIV program and TB programs at the initial time when um, uh, the uh, specimen referral started. But we have stabilized now and uh, everything is now handled by the integrated specimen referral network. So this slide talks about um, what was done at the beginning of the, uh, the pandemic. So following the outbreak, Nigeria adopted a three-pronged strategy for testing. The first prong was to expand the Lassa Fever lab network. And this network was using um, open uh, conventional PCR system for testing. And we had only five labs as at that time. But that was expanded to about 62 labs as at uh, last, uh, the first week of August with uh, the 62 labs are in 32 out of the 36 plus one states of Nigeria, uh, with um, 42 uh, conventional molecular labs and uh, 10 genus part labs at that date. 
The second prong was to leverage on existing PEPFAR lab network with high throughput testing equipment such as Roach Coba 68-8800 and Abbott M2000. And that has that's actually boosted the performance in terms of testing because then before these were called up, uh, the testing performance were, uh, was somehow low, but with the coming of this high throughput equipment that boosted the average daily uh, uh, testing rate or testing numbers for COVID. Another part of this second prong was to leverage on the National Integrated Specimen Referral Network to transport uh, samples from where they are collected to a hub before they are moved to the testing laboratory. And that is where uh, the bulk of my presentation is going to concentrate on, to concentrate on the National Integrated Specimen Referral Network. The third prong was to decentralize testing uh, to every state of Nigeria uh, because we have GeneSpot labs in every state of the, uh, the country to decentralize uh, testing to those uh, GeneSpot labs uh, using the, what uh, had been provided by PEPFAR and Global Ford to support the TB network. So this slide is a distribution of COVID cases and mapping of uh, SARS-CoV-2 laboratory uh, molecular lab testing in Nigeria. The map to my left is the distribution of cases. And the darker spot indicates states that have high confirmed cases. This is as at uh, a week ago. Then the, the map to my right represents COVID-19 testing uh, molecular lab networks in Nigeria. Like I said previously, uh, we have labs in 32, 32 states after the 37, uh, 36 plus one states. And I say 36 plus one, well, including this, uh, the, the capital of Nigeria, which is Abuja, which is sometimes con considered as a state when it comes to distribution of uh, uh, assets. So we have 62 completed labs, and out of those 62, 42 are labs with conventional equipment and um, uh, the closed um, uh, source uh, molecular laboratory. Then we have 10 GeneSpot labs. So, like I said before, we are concentrating on uh, sample referral, even though there are other contributions from the diagnostic network. Um, one of the major challenges when uh, the COVID pandemic started was uh, increasing sample collection and referral to testing labs. In fact, there were several compla complaints from uh, Nigerians of not having access to testing. Uh, so the NCDC, Nigerian Center for Disease Control, had an ongoing interstate sample referral system that used third-party logistics system called Tranex, but this was limited to some states. And in the wake of the COVID, the, some governments, state governments, started their respective intra and interstate sample referral for COVID-19 to complement what Tranex, what Tranex was doing in some other states. These, however, had logistics and uh, funding challenges because the funding was, uh, was erratic. So with funding from the United States Agency for International Def Development, USAID, the country leveraged on the integrated specimen referral to some support intrastate COVID-19 sample transport in select states. Yeah, so the states was, uh, were allocated six states out of the 30, 37 to support. Why Trinex, Trinex, like I said before, covered some states and um, other arrangements were put in place. So we had a, we have about th three um, forms of uh, sample referral. So Nistrin was uh, mandated to cover six out of the uh, 37 states. So we had clear expected outcomes for uh, Nistrin when we commenced the movement of samples for COVID-19. And the expectations were reduce the cost of sample movement from where they are collected to when they get to the lab, um, ensure that there's quicker testing 
and result return turnaround time. That is from testing to result, uh, re result return. We wanted a quicker or a reduced turnaround time. Another expectation was to ensure that, that it was a safe and secure specimen referral and transport system. And the fourth one was to facilitate a rapid expansion of COVID-19 testing, as well as other infectious diseases moving forward. That is to say, if there is ever any other pandemic or any disease condition, we should be able to provide support to cover such a disease condition. So what have we achieved so far? Uh, Nistrin has been able to move close to 10,000 samples between when we started moving samples in June to the first week of uh, August. And since the movement of sample commenced, no case of sample transport related infection has been reported about amongst those that are involved in movement of the samples. We have maintained an average turnaround time of about 2.95 hours for move, from movement, for movement of samples to the testing laboratories. And from the samples that have been moved so far, we have not recorded any sample rejection. There's also, the, we have been able to sustain, or uh, put in place a sustainable low cost hub and spoke model. Because what happens is that when we get to the states, we have meetings with stakeholders, and we try to ensure that the hub and spoke is well uh, laid out so that there is no haphazard, uh, haphazard movement of samples. And what we have done now is put in place something that can be used even after COVID. The movement of sample for COVID has, re has seen very minimal, we have very minimal disruption of testing services for the other diagnostic specimens, just like uh, I mentioned before, TB and HIV. So not, not much of effect on uh, these uh, disease programs. Uh, so there has been an effective clustering of collection sites for efficient sample pickup and cost uh, utilization. So we, like I said, we cluster to make sure because our own is to do intrastate movement. So we try to arrange so that we have a hub where the other uh, forms involved in sample movement can move from those hubs to the testing lab in each of the st six states where we are working. So this is just a graphical representation of uh, what we have moved so far uh, between June to the first week of August, like I uh, said earlier on. And you can see the TAT. Uh, in June, we had a TAT of 2 point, uh, turnaround time of 2.2. Uh, there was a slight increase in, uh, in July because there, are, there were restrictions and uh, other issues from getting the samples across at collection points to where they uh, are to be moved or for that, for, for that move to the testing laboratories. And that dropped in August because most of the restrictions in movement have been lifted. And so it's easier to move across because even despite the fact that we're involved in movement of COVID samples, we still had some challenges while moving from one point to the other, even though that was addressed by provision of um, uh, what uh, movement uh, uh, pass for the staff involved in sample movement. So what, were the limit what are the limitations we've seen? Uh, so like I said before, we have three forms of sample movement. We have the Tranex that is used by the National Center for Disease Control. Uh, we have the arrangements that was made by the state government and we have the Nistrin. And these have not been brought under one coordination. So it's different, it's difficult to coordinate. And we're hoping that with time, <clears throat> this will be addressed. And we're also hoping that by the time we have been able to uh, bring the pandemic under control, uh, the lessons we have learned from this will help us to bring other disease conditions under the uh, National Integrated Specimen Referral Network. 
Uh, so states were also implementing or implementing dependent plans for uh, COVID-19 diagnosis and management. Uh, this happens because some of them they didn't want samples from their states to be moved to other states for testing for one reason or the other, which is above the scope of this presentation. So that's also affected how samples were moved. Uh, the selection of COVID-19 sample collection sites did not align with existing health facilities that were on the national uh, sampling referral network. So instead of uh, capitalizing on what were already on ground, some of the states wanted a different arrangement as to where samples would be collected. Of course, there was high cost of intra-state and interstate sample movement using the conventional transport mechanisms that was um, uh, were available to uh, the other two forms of uh, sample movement. And we had inefficient mapping of COVID-19 sample collection sites to hub, which we addressed uh, that led to the delay in uh, starting the movement because we wanted to have a more efficient uh, sample, I mean, uh, hub and spoke arrangement so as to reduce the cost of sample movement. We have seen low volume of samples and some designated pickup uh, points. Uh, right now, that still persists because uh, people were uh, not forthcoming. Demand creation was low, so uh, sample volume uh, was also low at some pickup points in some states. So what are our recommendations? We recommend the, uh, aligning the selection of COVID-19 sample collection sites with pre-existing health facilities. And this was what we implemented in the state where we are working, that to ensure, to reduce the cost of movement and to bring about uh, general efficiency, that health facilities are already operating in such states should be used for sample collection. And from there, the samples will be moved to the testing laboratory. Uh, we are working with the government of Nigeria and we just have the docu had the document for the National Integrated Specimen Referral signed and uh, hoping that the coverage will be expanded to other states and after the pandemic is over, that um, we'll be able to cover more disease conditions as time goes on. So we are working with states to integrate COVID-19 testing into existing service delivery framework to ensure sustainability. Um, so like Josh said, what we are using to fund this is from PEPFA and the other funding from USAID. We are hoping that this will be integrated into government framework so that there will be sustainability of the national integrated sample uh, referral network. So I would like to thank all of you for listening. Thank you, Anova. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kingston. Uh, so next, uh, we will take uh, the last presentation uh, uh, on Zimbabwe, which I'm going to be playing from my end here. This presentation looks at the Zimbabwe country experience in leveraging investments in diagnostic networks optimization to expedite planning and implementation of SARS-CoV-2 laboratory testing. This presentation essentially covers four areas. One, background to diagnostic networks optimization, DNO in Zimbabwe. Two, how DNO has helped in expanding SARS-CoV-2 testing three, waste management, four, lessons learned. It is worth noting that Zimbabwe has more than 1,500 health facilities that are spread across the length and breadth of the country. It is worth highlighting that these more than 1,500 health facilities fall under four broad categories of clinics, district, provincial, and central. The national breakdown of these health facilities, as you can see on this page, is that the largest number of health facilities falls under clinics, constituting about 92.5% of total health facilities in Zimbabwe. These are followed by district health facilities, which constitute 6% of total health facilities, followed by provincial health facilities, which constitute 1% of 
of the total health facilities in Zimbabwe. Central hospitals have the least number constituting about 0.5% of total health facilities in Zimbabwe. It is also worth noting that these more than 1,500 health facilities are located across 10 provinces. The breakdown of health facilities per province has been provided for on this page. As part of the background to DNO in Zimbabwe, it is worth noting that Zimbabwe has more than 300 testing site locations that utilize various test equipment. These range from Aliq, Abbott, GeneXpert, Biomuri, Hologic, Roche, and Samba. There are about 328 testing equipment distributed across more than 300 testing site locations. Uh, I just wanted to make sure, uh, is it very clear that side? Uh, I'm getting comments that it's not very clear. Um, the images are not clear. All right. Uh, I don't know whether Nevu is back. Nevu, are you back? Are you able to take through the presentation? Nevu or Rife, are you there? Because I know Rife has dropped. I never. Uh, let me try to unmute. Never are you able to unmute? Uh, I know Rafa had challenges, uh, so he dropped. Rafa, are you there? So I was just going to play, uh, it looks like it's not working out. I could try and play the other recorded session. All right, maybe George, you can take one or two questions while I'm, whilst I'm trying to uh, fix this from my end. Okay, um, uh, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to um, Charles and Kingston. Um, it's very, very exciting to see uh, what uh, DNO has done to these uh, two countries at this time. Uh, there are so many uh, questions in the chat box, but we really just want to limit uh, them to some of the critical um, issues that everyone would like to know. Uh, I think that I have the first uh, question uh, here for Cameroon, which is uh, the current practice is uh, having a dedicated uh, transport for COVID-19. How do we uh, move uh, towards integration with other samples since a dedicated system may not uh, be sustainable? I think uh, the way forward, of course, let me just respond to this on behalf of the presenters. The way forward, as we said all the time, has been integrated uh, systems, not just for tram sample transports. We are always using integrated system, multiplexing, using HIV and related TB platforms for COVID testing. We also want to see that uh, being data system. So if any country is still uh, talking about silo uh, system for COVID transportation, I think they need to move towards the integrated uh, systems. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, I think one of the early presentations that we, we presented was on the need for integration. So I will leave that at this point because I know uh, Lara will be from WHO who is actually leading this integrated diagnostic uh, approaches. Uh, we'll also be commenting. I'm sure Lara, you will also address that. Um, Charles, this next question for you is um, how uh, did uh, the, the COVID testing uh, affect um, other testing to include HIV? and TB because the conversation and what we've heard all the time has been that COVID has actually affected. So the question that someone has for you is, um, how has this affected a TB and HIV testing in Cameroon? Over. Thanks, George. Uh, thanks for that question. 
I would say that across across the board, across the board, what we have observed uh, is that there's been there's been a, 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 a slight a slight slope of a decrease in terms of uh, number of tests that are being done um, for HIV, uh, more particularly um, viral load uh, data. So so we've been able to look at as well as even we've looked at data from point of care sites as well. Um, and we, we've also seen that there's been a slight slope of a decline in terms of number of tests that are being done uh, for, 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 for HIV, particularly for, for viral load and, and, and for EID. But basically, again, I tie this to, to one of the challenges we, we highlighted in our presentation, which was that there was repurposing of staff at the very beginning uh, when we were trying to respond to, to, to COVID. But over time, I think from the month of June, we start seeing a peak in, in, in HIV uh, testing data. So everything is almost getting back to normal. We, we, we are readjusting the way staff are allocated to the different, um, uh, different testing platforms, testing work streams. And then from, from June, we're beginning to see, and, and even this July, we're beginning to see the data both for HIV viral load and EID uh, even TB begin to, to pick up. But in between, there was a slight slope uh, of a decrease uh, that we, we, we observed. Over. Okay, um, thank you, Charles. Um, Anafi, are you able to resolve the issue? Uh, let me try to see if I'm able to. Yeah, if not, we can make progress. I think time is uh, against mm -hmm. us, so let me know. Yes are located across 10 provinces. The breakdown of health facilities per province has been provided for Let me know how it is. on this page. Slide six. I mean, the images again, not As part not of the background good. to DNA, well, we may have just to share the slide with the participants later on. more than 300 testing site locations that utilize various test equipment. All right, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I mean, we're sorry that this, um, the images are not good, but we really want to say that uh, Zimbabwe is one of those very, very first uh, countries that actually uh, fully implemented the diagnostic network optimization in a couple of meetings, including the ASLM conference last year, uh, two years ago, those who were present, we actually saw how um, Zimbabwe and Malawi, they actually presented data of integrated diagnostic system, showing how they could uh, do integration in terms of sample transport system using uh, both a TB platforms so or HIV and how it led to improvement and efficiency. I think we're sorry we're not able to get these slides to you, but you will have seen how this country again has added on to COVID-19 in, the, in their existing system and how it's still really moving on well. Just similar to what we saw for, for Nigeria and also uh, for Cameroon. So I think those slides will be shared. So in, in making a uh, progress, uh, maybe, uh, maybe Charles, you want to take one uh, question again before we go to move over to, to Kingston. But I think there's a question talking about um, how do you deal with issues around quality uh, assurance? Because I know that is very, very important. I think it came up a couple of times. So how was the quality of testing assured in the entire uh, diagnostic uh, network in Cameroon? Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for that question. I, I think that one, one of the things which I highlighted during my presentation was the, the, the coordination platform and the role which the National Public Health Lab, as well as the Santre Pasteur Institute in Yaoundé are actually playing uh, to making sure that uh, we, 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 we provide optimal services. So the Santre Pasteur, uh, which is the first lab which started COVID testing, is actually the lead lab uh, in terms of diagnosis in the country. And they are the ones piloting and, 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 and putting in place the QA systems for, for COVID. So essentially what happens is uh, for every, the, there is um, a protocol which has been put out, uh, which uh, states clearly uh, the number of, uh, I think for every batch of samples that are tested, there are, there are a certain number of samples, both positive and negative, which are collected from across all uh, 15 molecular testing labs and being retested at the level of the Santo Pasteur. The Santo Pasteur by ministerial decree is, one, is the lab uh, assigned to, to put in place a QA system around, around COVID testing. So, so basically um, they do repeat testing uh, from, from a defined protocol. Uh, samples are collected across all COVID testing labs and retested at, at Santo Pasteur. And again, just to highlight that before 
um, a given batch or a given lot of tests uh, are distributed in country to different labs, they are verified and, and controlled by the, by the Santo Pasteur. And then once that is validated, a protocol is established, which uh, it's used uh, you know, to guide testing across, across other labs. I, I can leave it there, but uh, beyond this call, we can actually provide more details uh, you know, around how we, we structure QA uh, under the, the lead of Santo Pasteur. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, Charles. So, Rifa is back online. I, I think he may be able to summarize some of the uh, the issues. Uh, uh, I think uh, whilst the slides are not really coming out clearly, um, but he can summarize. I think the activities that were done in, in Zimbabwe. Okay, uh, Rifa, you there? Um, uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you, Anas and George. And I'm and sorry, my of DNO work in Zimbabwe uh, and looks at the time horizon of 28. Uh, unless you need to put off the slide, I think we're getting echoes from the, the presentation. Yes, yeah. So sorry about the slides, uh, because I, I was traveling, so I don't have uh, stable internet and I'm connected through the phone. But uh, we'll share the slides, but I can summarize uh, what our presentation was talking to. And uh, basically, uh, uh, we did the diagnostic network uh, optimization, uh, which helped us, you know, in distributing the uh, pieces of machines to different parts of the country as by the need uh, of testing rather than by uh, political placement. A, a, a classical example being uh, having 10 provinces in the country. And if you have 10 machines, uh, historically, you just distribute one each per province, but we realized that there was no equal uh, 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 distribution as far as uh, the need or the demand for testing uh, was concerned. So having done that, uh, we also in the process developed uh, an integrated sample transportation, which we are happy that uh, we have received quite uh, a substantial amount of money from the Global Fund and the USG and we hope that it will be fully operational, operationalized by um, this year. Uh, so when uh, we started uh, having the COVID cases, uh, the testing was just centralized in one lab, which is the National Microbiology. Uh, as far as uh, transportation was concerned, uh, and this also impacted greatly on the turnaround time uh, of the results. Um, so we then also, and one of the challenges that we had, it was also that the primers that we first got were optimized for certain type of machines. So we had the ABI7500 and the ABX uh, uh, and the Quanti Studios. So again, these were only in Harare and the other one was in Bulawayo at a teaching university. So again, the, the problem of sample transportation uh, was also persistent. So we then now looked at the gene experts, which we have about one sixth of them in the country, and these are dotted throughout the tier system. So we then also looked at those that were at the centers that could provide uh, adequate uh, safety for the, for the workers and also handling of symbols and also we looked at those that could dispose of uh, uh, the waste uh, in, in, in a proper way. So we started with 15 labs for gene experts, which are the provincial laboratories and also uh, some labs which were at district level but sufficing to uh, uh, the requirements that we had set. So I'm, I'm happy to say these are now being multiplexed uh, uh, with TB. We are now doing the TB work and also doing the uh, COVID testing on these machines. And of this population of um, these gene experts, we also have about six of them which are doing EID and, uh, and HIV work. So basically the lessons that we have drawn from this uh, uh, exercise is it did mean that we had not done optimization. It was going to be very difficult even to add on testing and do uh, COVID testing for, for the country as the need uh, arose. 
And also we have realized that you need to have a very strong sample transportation system, which is not categorized by diseases. Like Smilk said, you know, to see that you can't verticalize TB, HIV, and all these on, on their own, but integrate everything uh, in, in, into one framework. And also we have realized that you need to have a very strong uh, and, and organized waste management uh, uh, system. Because for now, for Zimbabwe, we are currently in the process of discussing with uh, cement companies because we don't have designated uh, incinerators for liquid waste. And most of the waste that we are generating is liquid waste, especially from the Abbott machines. And also, even for the, for, for the, for the dry waste, we still need to uh, destroy it at very high temperatures above a thousand. So we are looking at the uh, cement companies and also the mining companies so that we can develop MOUs and also have the, the waste uh, uh, destroyed in, 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 a, in a proper way. And in the sample transportation system that we are being supported by Global Fund, we had also included vehicles, not only for sample transportation to central levels, but also modified to be able to carry uh, the waste from the peripheral areas so that we can also use it both ways, carry samples and also carry waste uh, uh, um, for, 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 for destruction. So in summary, this is the process that we have engaged and we are also looking at uh, expanding the testing on the Abbott machines. Currently from the Global Fund, we received uh, about 50,000 tests, which we are now for COVID-19 uh, testing, which we are also now doing uh, on, the, on, on designated uh, Abbott machines. But I would also want to say, as much as we had pushed this process for COVID, we are also very worried about not uh, destroying the gains uh, uh, that we have uh, gotten from the other programs, the TB testing and HIV testing. So we want to make sure that as much as we are multiplexing, it's a balanced uh, exercise which will not affect uh, the other tests. So in short, uh, I know I should have gone through the slides, but in short, this is uh, what, what describe the, the slides we're trying to describe. Uh, over to you, George. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Raiva. We are happy you were able to connect and give us this uh, sort of very big picture on Zimbabwe. Just as I said earlier, uh, Zimbabwe has been a model for other countries in terms of integrated diagnostic and uh, DNO systems. Yet, yeah, great. I think you brought in something very, very important, the need for us to ensure uh, the gains of the other systems, including long years, uh, years of investment in, in HIV and TB. And I think uh, that has happened so well. Um, in Zimbabwe and in other countries as we saw. And also the fact that you have this very, very good relationship with the cement uh, factory in managing waste because that has been an important issue. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we really want to make a progress. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, Kingston, I have a question for you for, for Nigeria. So uh, someone wants to know if uh, your DNO efforts incorporated the private uh, health facilities including both uh, profit and non-profit and the face-based uh, uh, organizations. Over. Yeah, thank you, uh, George. Um, so for now, the DNO effort um, has not covered private fa facilities or private uh, organizations, but we are open to bringing in more um, uh, organizations and even other disease conditions. So like I said before, uh, we started with HIV and TB, uh, but uh, the document uh, empowering the uh, Nistrin uh, was signed recently by the Honorable Minister for Health. And with that, there are some coordinating bodies that need to be put in place. As soon as that is done, uh, it's, we create that avenue for us to be able to reach out to uh, more individuals, more organizations, and even other, uh, more disease conditions. So the discussions are, are ongoing, and very soon we are going to expand to cover because it's, it's, it's an integrated specimen referral, so it's not disease-specific. It's not for the public sector uh, alone. So uh, with time, we are going to accommodate 
Um, no, that is very, very helpful. Thanks a lot. I think there's a need for your country program to quickly move in that direction because you're talking about national uh, diagnostic systems and not, uh, again, of course, it's not is it specific, nor is it partner or regional specific. So good to hear that from you. Again, uh, we're just trying to limit this to what is very essential to uh, create a good pathway for expansion of COVID in other countries. There is also the same question that uh, Charles responded for Cameroon talking about how has uh, COVID testing affected your turnaround time and other testing services? Again, I want to hear from other countries because this is the worry that people so much are afraid of integration that it's going to crumble other systems and so on. So how has this been managed in the case of Nigeria? Over. Okay, thank you again. So, like I said during my presentation, there has been minimal, inter uh, minimal interruption of sample movement. But again, we're also involved in the testing components, even though my presentation centered on sample referral. So, what we did with our, the labs, uh, the PEPFAR labs for HIV and TB, was to dedicate, for instance, the Abbott Laboratory, we dedicated one machine for COVID testing because our mega labs have four, some have four machines, some have five. So, we dedicated one for COVID testing. And so that was used why the other ones cover um, viral load and EID testing. For the Roach equipment, the 8800, uh, 8, we also dedicated uh, one machine to uh, COVID testing. But we went beyond that and said, okay, can we do COVID testing in the night? So samples come in during the day, HIV testing is run. Then in the night, the COVID testing is done. The contamination is done at the end of the work and HIV testing resumes. So, and, but one good thing again that happened during the peri this period, uh, uh, you know, there was a reduction in people coming for viral load and EID testing because of the restriction in movement and all that. So, uh, uh, the number of samples coming in was also reduced. So, there was not much of an impact. And in fact, it has given us a kind of a template that we can use uh, for the integration that we are pushing. Meaning that you can also look at um, the testing performance. So, for instance, we are looking at using uh, GNSPAD for EID testing as kind of POC now. Uh, we we'll look at facilities that are uh, low volume uh, uh, in terms of the number of TB testing that is done and are close to facilities that have uh, a reasonable number of EID, I mean EID samples. So those are places where you can direct the redundancies from the TB testing is used to test EID. But what we have seen with um, COVID testing is like a template that we can uh, use to ensure the implementation of integration of uh, testing. Good, good. Thank um, thank you so much, um, Anashi. Yes. Uh, so we will hear some remarks from. Uh, WHO, uh, unfortunately, she could not be here as well, uh, but I'll play, try to play her recording as well. Hopefully, it comes out um, well. Let me know if it is not coming through. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Anafi and ASLM, for organizing this important session and inviting us to participate. The discussion today was of critical importance, and we are noticing this now more than ever. Quality, people integrated service delivery and care are key aims of universal health coverage, and we believe that coordinating, integrating, and sharing diagnostics will pave the way for doing so in other health services. The examples and best practices shared today are very impactful examples of strong leadership, coordination, and innovation that would ideally be expanded to other countries and health services. While we are seeing integration of diagnostic services and sharing of devices within the COVID response, it is imperative that we continue to support our HIV and TB testing needs. A number of countries have observed reduced infant diagnosis and viral load testing, some perhaps due to reduced attendance at healthcare facilities, but also due to deprioritization of testing and or co-opting laboratory commodities and consumables to conduct COVID testing. Within the COVID response, it remains essential to continue HIV and TB testing and treatment. Otherwise, we could see significantly increased morbidity and mortality from HIV and TB. To close, WHO is fully supportive of developing integrated, optimized systems, sharing technologies and services within the diagnostic network. 
We want to also point everyone towards two documents that recently developed, a joint HIV-TB key considerations document for diagnostics integration, and a follow-up report that goes into depth on critical areas including best practices from countries, financing and cost sharing, diagnostic network optimization and mapping, patient prioritization and systems integration. Thank you all again and back to you Anafi. Okay, um, uh, thanks, thanks to everyone. Uh, again, it's been a great uh, presentation. We all now see the benefits of uh, diagnostic network optimization. As countries work towards refining their programs, we know that when you go through the DNO process, that actually leads to efficiency. We've seen improvement in access to diagnostics in many of the countries. And of course, there's impact. So I just want to say that um, all what you see so far has been a coordinated effort. We have what we call the Integrated Diagnostic Consortium. Uh, that has uh, been coordinating all the activities. That consortium is made up of um, uh, all the lab stakeholders, including Ministry of Health. You have Global Fund, you have WHO, PEPFA, CHI, everybody, LSLM. So if uh, a particular country presentation has come up, um, again, it's not one man or one, one, a single individual doing all this, but that has been done by a coordinated effort. We really want to use this opportunity to thank um, you all and thank the presenters and also to the policymakers, please, uh, this is an opportunity for you to make use of resources that are available to ensure how you can expand your diagnostics and ensure an efficient and coordinated systems for your countries. So with this, um, I'm Anafi, I hand over to you. Again, we're not able to respond to all the questions. I'm sure um, Anafi will explain um, how this is going to happen. Definitely the be a recorded version of the presentations and probably an opportunity for us to respond to some of the questions. Over to you, Anafi. Thank you, George. Um, it, it has been really a wonderful presentation uh, and we have quite a lot of questions that came through. Um, as usual, we're going to compile these and uh, share these with the presenters uh, to respond uh, possibly in writing uh, so that we can be able to share with you as we share the slides as well. Uh, we continue to have these sessions uh, weekly and uh, soon we'll be announcing the next session as we come. But for me, really is to appreciate uh, I think the work of all stakeholders um, the implementers, uh, the IDC, uh, the donors, PEPA, Global Fund, UNITAID, um, ministries of health, most importantly, and the health workers and program managers, and all of you who are making sure that we use and optimize uh, all these investments that are in place in order to win this pandemic. Uh, till we meet again, uh, I'd like to say uh, goodbye. Uh, and as you log off, I'm going to be sharing um, the code for printing uh, certificates of attendance.